name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to another lecture in the series Ways of Knowing God. Uh, this uh, third lecture uh, deals with uh, God's historical revelation, uh, theophanies, and uh, uh, knowing God uh, through pondering the scriptural witness. Uh, by way of recapitulation uh, on slide two, uh, I have piled up a few uh, details, elements that we already know from uh, uh, previous conversations. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, if uh, uh, we know of God and we know uh, God at all, that's first and foremost because of uh, God's love and uh, grace and mercy towards us. As uh, we read in uh, uh, the first letter of St. Paul to Timothy in chapter 2. Another element uh, of interest that we have already encountered is uh, um, the beginning of the letter to the Hebrews where um, uh, the author, we suppose uh, it's St. Paul or one of his disciples, uh, points out the fact that uh, God has uh, spoken to us in a variety of ways and gradually throughout uh, the centuries. Um, first and foremost uh, uh, to the patriarchs, uh, through the prophets and then um, uh, finally through his son uh, who is uh, also the creator of the ages. Another element of uh, importance is the fact that uh, our knowledge of uh, God is mediated by uh, God's son, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, as we read in uh, the first chapter uh, in the Gospel of St. John. There is no way in which we can know God uh, than through the revelation of uh, God's Son. And then uh, we have already encountered uh, two uh, saints uh, of the Byzantine era, uh, Saint Maximus the Confessor in the 7th century and uh, Saint John Damascene in the 8th century. Um, I have addressed uh, briefly uh, passages that were relevant to our previous conversations uh, from St. Maximus's Book of Difficulties, uh, or the Ambigua, and St. John Damascene's uh, Exact Exposition of the Orthodox Faith. Uh, in St. Maximus there's a topic that um, is highly metaphorical, at least uh, at first glance. Um, namely, he speaks of uh, uh, the triple incarnation of the Logos, or Word of God, or, or Son of God. Um, and uh, what's uh, important uh, for my purposes today uh, is the second so-called incarnation uh, in history and as recorded through the scriptures uh, which uh, uh, idea or understanding led him to speak of uh, a written law so we uh, know God through uh, this historical incarnation which is further fleshed out um, uh, excuse the pun in um, uh, the written law of scripture and then in uh, St. John Damascene we have another historical outline of uh, the stages of divine revelation uh, in history, Old Testament, New Testament and culminating in the revelation of uh, uh, the only begotten Son, our Lord and Savior and God uh, as he says Jesus Christ. Now uh, in terms of uh, the outlines of uh, this lecture, uh, slide 3 uh, I will be addressing uh, aspects pertaining to God's revelation in history, uh, followed by um, uh, an excursus uh, into the topic which is quite interesting and related to um, the scriptural testimony, namely um, the topic of a theophany or God's manifestation, uh, to end by uh, addressing uh, ways in which we can uh, contemplate God's marks or God's signatures uh, in Scripture. Slide 4. God's revelation in history. Uh, returning to uh, a text that uh, I have already uh, discussed, uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 1, uh, the first two verses, we read, in many various ways, God spoke of all to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world, or the ages, more literally if you like. 
uh, what this text uh, outlines is the fact that history isn't something that just flows. Uh, we are accustomed to uh, speak of the arrow of time, uh, comes from the past, uh, traverses uh, the present and goes towards, points towards the future. Uh, we have um, uh, this kind of temporal outline uh, well represented, for instance, even in um, in scripture, you know, we have uh, the first book of, uh, of the Bible, which is called Genesis, the book of origins. Uh, and so we have, uh, at the end of, uh, of the Christian scripture, uh, the book of Revelation, which uh, ends on a, uh, if you like, a similar note by speaking of uh, another beginning, uh, but it's this new beginning is, is situated at the end of, uh, of the history as we know it. Uh, so the arrow of time is a reality, but uh, what uh, the scriptures teach us is the fact that time doesn't simply fly, uh, time doesn't simply flow and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and goes away. Uh, what, uh, uh, what's very interesting, what's very characteristic to the scriptural testimony is uh, this emphatic uh, affirmation that time is also a space that is utilized by uh, God uh, for God's purposes uh, in order to reveal God's self to us, in order to uh, establish alliances, covenants with us, uh, in order to save us, in order to bring us to uh, life eternal. Uh, history, for instance, we uh, also read uh, in uh, the genealogies of the Lord in, uh, uh, in the New Testament somehow uh, echoing the genealogies of the Old Testament. H history is something that uh, is organized, if you like, symmetrically. When we look at um, uh, the first chapter in uh, the Gospel of St. Matthew, we see that uh, uh, between uh, the patriarch of, uh, of God's people, Abraham, and uh, um, uh, the arrival of the Lord, uh, there are three series of uh, uh, 14 generations. Uh, this is a, uh, um, uh, a sign that history doesn't simply flow and that God is indeed a, a, the Lord of, of history. Well, what uh, this uh, passage, is, uh, passage in uh, Hebrews 1 uh, teaches us is the fact that uh, alongside being uh, guided providentially by God, history is also a space uh, within which God speaks to us. Um, and in so doing, God makes uh, possible the encounter between uh, God's self and uh, uh, God's people, ourselves. In uh, uh, the 4th century, uh, a great um, uh, father of the Church, St. Gregory the Theologian, in his uh, oration uh, 31, uh, which is uh, the fifth theological oration in, in one of the series of his sermons, that is, uh, points out the fact that uh, this divine um, lordship exercised throughout history um, has taken uh, the form of a number of uh, successive earthquakes. That's a metaphor, of course. Uh, earth, uh, earthquakes by which um, the divine pedagogy has moved um, uh, humanity, uh, its culture, its mentality from a certain, a certain understanding of reality to another uh, understanding of reality. Uh, it's like a progression and in, um, uh, in the words of, uh, of Sangorian the Theologian from paganism and, and idolatry uh, to uh, the Old Testament, the law of, of Moses where we have the, the revelation uh, of the true God and then from that uh, Old Testament to the New Testament instituted by uh, Christ our Lord and also St. Uh, uh, Gregory the Theologian uh, highlights um, the importance of the, the event of the Pentecost which should be seen in tandem with uh, uh, the arrival of Christ but also uh, as inaugurating uh, a new era in the history of uh, both church and, and humankind. Uh, one way or the other, what matters uh, is the fact that uh, 
both the scriptures and um, uh, the church fathers uh, uh, give testimony to the fact that God does speak in history, God does reveal God's self in history, and therefore if uh, we know anything about God, if any knowledge of God is possible, that's first and foremost, I repeat, due to God's love towards us. Uh, now, um, uh, looking more closely, uh, in slide 5, uh, to uh, the main stages of uh, God's historical revelation, um, as um, uh, the structure of uh, the Christian Bible suggests, there are two main stages. Of course, uh, we can identify a number of alliances, promises, covenants um, um, that uh, have unfolded in history. We can um, speak of a covenant between uh, God and uh, Adam and Eve, uh, then one between God and Noah, uh, and uh, God and Abraham, and then uh, through Moses, uh, a new alliance between God and, uh, and Israel. And then uh, the prophets uh, have disclosed the intention of God uh, of uh, uh, setting up a new covenant which is universal through His Son and our Lord Jesus Christ, um, which is an alliance between God and God's people, uh, no longer limited to a certain ethnic pool or um, gene pool, uh, a covenant that uh, encompasses each and everyone, uh, and the cosmos itself, as we read, for instance, at the end of uh, uh, the Gospel according to St. Mark, um, the Apostles are sent by the risen Lord uh, to preach uh, the Gospel to the entire creation, not only the entire humankind. But strictly speaking, um, as testified by the two main parts of uh, Christian scriptures, uh, we have an Old Covenant or Old Testament and a New Covenant. Uh, what is um, uh, particular to the two covenants uh, in relation to the topic of interest, namely divine revelation and uh, ways of knowing God? Uh, in the Old Covenant, uh, we have uh, a very personal form of divine revelation, uh, very private, I would uh, rather say, uh, God talking directly to the patriarch of Israel, uh, the ancestors of Israel, the ancestors of God, uh, God's people, um, establishing private alliances, personal alliances with them, and also giving them promises for uh, further glory. And then uh, the major moment uh, of uh, of uh, God's revelation uh, on Sinai, Mount Sinai, and Moses becomes um, the mediator of this alliance between God and, uh, and Israel. And uh, uh, we also find in, uh, uh, in the Old Testament the fact that uh, God has spoken uh, in each generation through the prophets. Uh, on the one hand, uh, in an attempt to uh, remind the Israelites about the covenant uh, which was established in the time of Moses. On the other hand, um, uh, announcing uh, the establishment of a new covenant, the new alliance. In relation to the New Testament, uh, what we have uh, in, uh, in the Gospels, for instance, and in the preaching of St. Paul, uh, is um, the acknowledgement of Christ as a teacher, as a matter of fact, Christ as uh, the supreme teacher, the one that uh, possesses the entire wisdom, uh, who is the embodiment of, uh, of God's wisdom, who reveals uh, God truthfully to God's people. Uh, and uh, uh, as I already pointed out in the recapitulation of the previous material, uh, it is through Christ Jesus that uh, we human beings uh, receive a uh, veritable, truthful uh, uh, knowledge uh, of uh, God the Father. But Christ is also uh, the mediator of a perfect testament, a, a perfect alliance between um, um, the Holy Trinity and, uh, and God's people. In other words, uh, like in the Old Testament, uh, the supreme revelation or the perfect revelation takes place 
uh, within the parameters uh, of, uh, of an alliance, of a testament, of a covenant. Uh, this is a very interesting aspect, uh, in, in fact, that uh, we, uh, we should ponder, uh, briefly at least. Uh, namely the fact that divine revelation isn't something that happens uh, out of the blue. Uh, divine revelation and the knowledge of God uh, aren't possible um, uh, in isolation, outside some parameters, uh, more specifically outside a community of believers, uh, which uh, for us Christians is the Ecclesia, the Church. Uh, what uh, happens in both Testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, is an alliance uh, the first one mediated uh, by Moses, the second one mediated by the uh, very Son of God. Uh, and this testament establishes a community of believers. This testament, or these two testaments, have established two communities of believers. Um, and uh, these communities of believers are those that receive the revelation in a variety of ways. Uh, these uh, uh, communities are those that are supposed to undertake the adventure of uh, ascending towards God, uh, of knowing God, and uh, this is an aspect that cannot be separated at all uh, from uh, uh, the topic of, of interest uh, throughout these lectures, namely uh, ways of knowing God. Uh, why I am pointing this out? It is uh, because uh, in more recent times, the history of Christianity is lengthy, and in more recent times, maybe not in the last few years, but in the last few centuries or so, uh, there have been uh, obvious uh, developments uh, that are somehow uh, contrary to this understanding that um, the divine revelation and the knowledge of God are possible within a community of believers, within the Church. Um, we have... Uh, uh, many uh, trends within uh, contemporary Christianity where um, it's all about uh, personal faith, personal belief, um, where people uh, can uh, draw their idea of God from um, either the internet where they find the, the scriptures or uh, any other material or uh, again from a direct reading from, from the scriptures. And uh, uh, personally I believe that uh, uh, this is um, a derailment from uh, uh, the actual intention uh, of the divine revelation uh, which was always um, uh, entwined with the establishing of testaments, in other words the establishing of uh, um, communities of believers where that faith can be um, received, uh, transmitted uh, and also tested or uh, verified. Uh, by that community of believers. Moving to slide 6, uh, a topic that is um, uh, very important in relation to the divine revelation as unfolding uh, uh, throughout history um, is that of the agents of revelation. As we're reading in the scriptures, uh, the Father doesn't seem to be intervening much uh, in uh, uh, our affairs, um, at least not uh, uh, when we uh, take at face value uh, the scriptures. Of course, in Christian theology, we know that uh, the Holy Trinity always uh, works in a Trinitarian way, that there is no activity uh, of God that uh, is uh, uh, affected individually. Uh, as St. Athanasius the Great in the 4th century has taught us, uh, God always works uh, from the Father through the Son in the Holy Spirit. In other words, um, even when we speak of the revelation of God in the Old Testament, that's not the revelation uh, of the Father uh, on, uh, on His own or of the Son on His own. It's always uh, the Father that speaks through uh, the Son and in the Holy Spirit or together with the Holy Spirit. So, when we uh, refer to the agents of revelation, or uh, the source of revelation rather, we actually speak of uh, uh, the immediate uh, impact of 
uh, the second and the third persons of the Holy Trinity, the Son and the Spirit. Uh, as I said, the Father isn't uh, uh, that present for, for some reason. Um, a reason that we, we don't need to delve into uh, today. Uh, of course, we have heard the words of the Father um, at the River Jordan uh, upon um, uh, the baptism of the Lord, where uh, the, uh, the Father's voice uh, witnesses to the divinity of the Son. This is my Son. And the same voice um, uh, is heard, uh, for instance, on Mount Tabor, where uh, Christ uh, undertakes transfiguration in, um, um, in the presence of uh, three of his disciples and the same voice of the Father testifies as this is my son. But apart from, uh, from such instances, uh, as uh, the fathers of the church have uh, taught us, uh, the voices, uh, or the divine voices rather, throughout the scriptures in uh, Old Testament and uh, New Testament uh, are usually the voices of the Son and the Spirit. And um, I'd like to give you two uh, examples, actually uh, I'll refer to uh, three texts, uh, two from the Gospel according to St. John and um, one from um, the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. Uh, the first uh, passage is from John chapter 1 verse 18, no one has ever seen God the only Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has made Him known. Uh, it's a text to which I have alluded already, and it basically conveys the fact that the Father doesn't speak to us directly. The Father speaks to, uh, to us through the mediation uh, of His Son. Um, the Son, our Lord Christ, is the one through whom uh, God the Father is revealed to us. So, in this case, the agent of revelation is, of course, the Word of God, the Son of God. The second uh, scriptural text from John uh, chapter 15, verse 26, uh, reads as follows. When the Comforter comes, the Comforter is the, uh, one of the names of the Holy Spirit, when the Comforter comes, when I shall, uh, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness to me. In this case, um, the text uh, speaks of three persons, the three persons of the Divine Trinity. Uh, the Spirit is the main agent of Revelation here. The Spirit is the one that uh, discloses God, and uh, the Spirit or Comforter uh, comes from the Father. Like the Son, the Spirit comes from the Father and uh, uh, in coming to us from the Father, proceeding from the Father as uh, we read in, in John 15, uh, the Spirit discloses to us uh, the knowledge of the Son. So, we have uh, in the first uh, verse, uh, John uh, chapter 1, the Son as agent of divine revelation. Uh, and then in uh, John 15, we have the Spirit as agent of revelation. What matters here is the fact that uh, the divine persons, uh, at least the Son and the Spirit through whom the Father operates in the world, um, work together. And although uh, for instance, in the uh, line from the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, we read, uh, we believe in the Holy Spirit, um, dots, dots, who has spoken through the prophets, or who spoke through the prophets. Um, what the Spirit uh, speaks about is, as we read in uh, John 15, is the Son. So, the divine revelation uh, doesn't come simply from the Father. Uh, the Father uh, is well pleased to uh, speak to us, uh, both directly when He gives testimony about the divinity of the Son, but most uh, times the Father speaks to us 
through his son and the spirit plus there's this very interesting connection between uh, the son and the spirit in that uh, they seem to point to one another in the great eschatological and eucharistic um, uh, sermon of the lord in uh, uh, john from chapter 14 to uh, chapter um, uh, 16 uh, Christ announces the arrival of the Spirit, the coming of the Spirit. In other words, Christ not only reveals the Father, Christ reveals or announces uh, the coming of the Spirit. On the other hand, the Spirit is the one that coming uh, down from heaven reveals to us the Son of the Father. Uh, in other words, uh, when uh, we speak of the source or, or the agent or agents of revelation, we need to be mindful of the fact that uh, whether um, the scriptures speak of one person or two persons, in reality it is always uh, a cooperation within the Holy Trinity. And of course in uh, uh, addressing this matter I uh, uh, sort of uh, intended to whet your appetite in relation to another course that uh, God will now be offering uh, on uh, uh, Trinitarian theology. Moving to um, uh, slide 7 uh, and uh, to wrap up uh, the topic of uh, divine revelation in history or God's revelation in history, um, there are a few uh, other things that should be pointed out. What does that mean, revelation? Um, well, the word in the, uh, the original Greek New Testament is um, uh, apocalypsis. It's uh, disclosure, to make known something that was hidden. Um, revelation, uh, or the word revelation in, in English and other modern languages comes from the Latin, revelatio. And, uh, it means pretty much the same, disclosure, to make known something. Uh, when we say the divine revelation, we refer to God's intention and activity, as a matter of fact, uh, of disclosing God's self to us. It's uh, like sending letters, my favorite uh, analogy, sending letters. Uh, God writes the, uh, the letters, the messages, uh, and um, God sends these messages, these letters to, to us. Uh, there's never revelation or self-disclosure without an addressee. And uh, the addressee, as we have already known, um, heard uh, earlier, uh, the addressee is a community, God's people. So, God speaks to us, God sends messages, sends letters to us, and in so doing, uh, God has to adjust um, uh, God's strategies, if you like, according to our parameters. Uh, you can imagine that uh, uh, God didn't um, uh, speak uh, uh, Greek eternally, uh, or Hebrew, uh, or English for that matter. Uh, when uh, we uh, look at the original uh, uh, New Testament writings, you know, uh, in Greek, you know, that's uh, actually uh, a second version of uh, the Divine Words, because the first version of the Divine Words, at least in history, uh, was uh, in the language of the Hebrews or in Aramaic. Um, what, uh, uh, what we contemplate when we read whatever version of the scriptures, whether Hebrew or Aramaic or Greek or English or God knows what other language, what we read is a translation. Even in the original Greek uh, New Testament, that's still a translation. Whose translation? It is God's translation into a human language. What I want to say here is the fact that uh, when um, uh, we speak about uh, God's revelation in history and the embodiment of this revelation in a certain text, the, the, the text of, of the various scriptures, uh, what uh, we're talking about is uh, an act of love. Out of love God wants to disclose God's self to us, and in order to do so, God 
has to translate uh, God's inner life in ways that aren't divine. Ways that aren't divine. We are not gods. We are supposed to become gods, but we are not gods. We are supposed to uh, uh, grow from being in the image of God uh, to becoming godlike. But we aren't gods. Uh, we are human beings and we are created. And therefore, when we speak of the divine revelation, we speak of approximations of God's wisdom translated in our language, according to our parameters, according to our limitations. Uh, St. Ephraim the Syrian and, and, and others have uh, noticed this divine effort, um, this, um, the Greeks would call it syngatabasis. Uh, in English you translate this word usually as condescension, but condescension it means something else in, in English these days, so I, I won't be using this translation. Syngatabasis would mean uh, God comes down to us to embrace us, together with us. In other words, uh, when God speaks to us, uh, God humbles God's self so that we, uh, we, we, we can understand what He says. Um, and uh, from this viewpoint, uh, when we uh, contemplate the testimonies of God's revelation, either in creation or in history, uh, we should um, uh, be humbled by uh, this uh, tremendous effort on the part of God to uh, put God's self, God's inner life, uh, in words that aren't divine, that are our words, and therefore to realize that um, in the, the work of translation, which is that of the divine revelation, um, as a matter of fact, God has uh, put on uh, a, la uh, a language that was stranger to, to him. Uh, but the fact that uh, God has um, uh, spoken to us, uh, either in Hebrew or in Aramaic or in Greek or in Latin uh, or in Coptic or any other language afterwards, uh, is, uh, uh, I repeat, a sign of love and also a hope-giving sign that uh, all the languages of the earth are supposed to be cultivated, transformed by being touched uh, by the divine revelation. Uh, I believe that what I try, uh, I think that what I try to uh, offer here is the idea of, uh, of a lesson uh, that the way uh, God has chosen several languages uh, to speak in originally, uh, in the same way we should uh, utilize all the languages of the earth in order to continue the work of translation which has already begun with God speaking to us in one or two or a few uh, original languages. And uh, a final point um, in relation to the record of, uh, of the divine revelation in history uh, there are many forms in which the divine revelation uh, was recorded. Uh, the first form of, uh, uh, of recording or memorizing uh, divine revelation uh, was the oral tradition, first of, uh, of the temple and the synagogue and then of the church. Uh, neither uh, the, uh, the synagogue nor the church have begun by uh, possessing a book. Uh, neither the synagogue nor the church uh, have begun by, uh, by being uh, religions of a book or another. Uh, tradition is as important as uh, the written uh, record, particularly the scriptures. But uh, what is very important in relation to the scriptures is the fact that they are a, um, a truthful record of, uh, of divine revelation, or rather an inspired record of the divine revelation, as we read in the second letter uh, to Timothy in chapter 3, verse 16, uh, which makes of the scriptures uh, a, uh, a truthful, a veridic, uh, faithful record of uh, whatever God has uh, done 
for our sake in history. Now moving to the topic of Theophanies, uh, slide 8. Um, we realize that uh, God has spoken uh, to us in the past in a variety of ways, not only verbally. Uh, the scriptural um, uh, record shows God talking to us and um, uh, his uh, elect talking to us about God or talking to God themselves. There are, however, other ways in which um, the divine revelation has unfolded in, in, in uh, history. And uh, uh, one of uh, the privileged uh, ways, uh, non-verbal privileged ways of the divine revelation um, is uh, that of uh, the theophanies or manifestations of God. Um, these are symbolic manifestations, symbolic revelations of God through means created. God doesn't only speak uh, our languages. God also uses, and this is something that we have uh, uh, found last time, uh, uses the entire universe, the entire cosmos as language. If you remember what I told you about uh, Saint Athanasius the Great, in his Against the Gentiles, he refers to uh, the cosmos as, uh, as a book. And everything uh, within the cosmos is like a letter or a word put together uh, the elements of the universe, put together the various um, uh, creatures within the cosmos and if you know how to read those letters you will be able to um, identify the sentences of the divine revelation. Uh, theophanies are um, somehow at the crossroads of this um, revelation through creation that I have spoken of uh, last time and uh, the historical revelation uh, that I'm talking uh, about today. Why are the crossroads? It's uh, because on the one hand Theophanies use means created, in other words uh, a Theophany is a divine manifestation through something that exists in the natural world, a mountain uh, a thicket, a bush, uh, a river, and so on and so forth. And these become uh, uh, milieus of divine revelation. So on the one hand, they belong with uh, the divine revelation through creation. On the other hand, they uh, do not occur continuously. They occur in time, uh, historically. And we can identify a certain theophany that took place, for instance, when Moses was uh, a shepherd, <laughs> uh, tending to the flocks of, uh, of his uh, um, uh, father-in-law from the mountains, uh, and uh, uh, he encountered God in, uh, in a bush, the burning bush uh, theophany. Uh, that's not something that happens all the time. That isn't something that uh, has to do with the, uh, the everyday life of God's creation of the natural world. Theophanies are therefore uh, something in which we can recognize the elements of both forms of revelation, historical and cosmic. Uh, what uh, is um, uh, interesting uh, about theophanies uh, and why I uh, discuss theophanies in connection with the scriptures is the fact that uh, uh, the most reliable theophanies uh, are described in the scriptures or throughout the scriptures and uh, um, the scriptures therefore become a record not only of, uh, of uh, the verbal uh, revelation of God they also um, uh, record this more symbolic or mystical form of manifestation or, or revelation through means created. And let me give you a few examples. For instance, in uh, Genesis uh, 28, uh, we have a beautiful uh, image, that of um, uh, the dream or the vision of one of the patriarchs, uh, Jacob. Uh, he was running uh, from uh, Palestine to Mesopotamia and uh, 
uh, at night he had this vision of a ladder um, uh, uniting uh, earth and heaven and the angels of God uh, climbing uh, up and down the ladder. Um, this um, uh, vision uh, is interpreted by the Lord himself according to the Gospel um, uh, of John uh, as a reference to himself. At the end of the first chapter of, uh, of John uh, we have um, uh, Christ uh, conversing with uh, his first disciples and uh, he points out the fact that um, many more things you will be seeing, greater things you will be seeing about me, uh, not only the fact that I could prophesy this or that, uh, you will be seeing uh, the heavens opened and the angels of God um, uh, climbing up and down uh, on the uh, Son of Man. In other words, Christ, who calls himself the Son of Man, the Son of Adam, that is, uh, identifies uh, himself as the object of that dream of Jacob. The ladder of, uh, um, uh, of Jacob, uh, uniting heaven and earth, is the one that unites heaven and earth, Christ Jesus, who uh, in his uh, existence uh, has uh, brought together uh, in utmost unity uh, the uncreated and the creator. Then uh, in Exodus uh, chapter 3, um, the famous theophany of the burning bush already mentioned, uh, Moses uh, was a shepherd. He was tending uh, to the flocks of uh, his uh, um, father-in-law and uh, whilst being with, uh, with the sheep um, uh, on the mountain, uh, he saw uh, this uh, uh, bush that was burning without burning. It was a blaze, but um, uh, that fire didn't consume uh, the material of um, um, of the bush, um, and of course, um, um, becoming uh, uh, aware of the fact that uh, that's something uh, that is extraordinary. Uh, an encounter between Moses and God took place, but it was occasioned by that uh, first. Um, sign uh, of the burning bush. Of course, in, um, uh, in uh, later uh, texts, in uh, the traditional interpretations of the Church Fathers, uh, this image of, uh, of the burning bush has become um, uh, emblematic for both the reality of Christ and that of his mother, the Holy Theotokos and Virgin Mary. Uh, there are interpreters uh, that uh, have seen the same image of the burning bush as a symbol uh, of the Virgin Mother. On the one hand, uh, the, uh, the Theotokos uh, gives birth to her son, our Lord Christ. On the other hand, uh, in uh, becoming a mother and, and giving birth, uh, she remains a virgin, like uh, the bush that, that was burning but was not consumed by the fire. But other interpretations uh, see um, the burning bush theophany as a revelation of uh, Christ's complex, if you like, uh, uh, structure, um, existence. Because um, uh, Christ is on the one hand created, having uh, a human nature uh, like ours, on the other hand, uh, Christ is God, uh, like the fire that uh, uh, was uh, uh, burning uh, in that bush, but without consuming the bush. The fire would be uh, a symbol of Christ's divinity, uh, and, and the bush itself would be a symbol of Christ's humanity, and so on and so forth. Of course, <laughs> you would say uh, theophanies uh, may mean many things, and indeed, this is why uh, I uh, have stressed uh, so much the aspect of a community of interpretation that needs to uh, be consulted in relation to the meaning or the significance of such uh, extraordinary events. Another example is that of um, Isaiah chapter 6, uh, where the prophet had a vision whilst being in temple, uh, and uh, uh, in the temple there, uh, he has 
seeing uh, the throne of glory and upon the throne of glory uh, a glorified uh, son of man uh, uh, the image of the son of man which is of course uh, 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 an eschatological image of Christ himself uh, surrounded by the seraphim who were uh, singing hymns to the Lord. Uh, similarly, uh, Prophet Ezekiel, and uh, this is uh, actually right in the beginning of the prophecy of Ezekiel, chapter 1, um, the prophet uh, was uh, on his way with other slaves to, towards um, Babylon, and uh, he had the vision uh, of, uh, of a divine chariot, or a chariot of glory, again, uh, the figure of uh, the glorious Son of Man sitting on, on that chariot or throne of glory uh, surrounded by other angelic figures, the cherubim. And then, uh, of course, there are many more, but I'm just giving you a, a few highlights. Um, the culminating uh, theophany uh, uh, that uh, took place at the River Jordan, for instance, we read about it in the Synoptic Gospels, say Matthew chapter 3. Uh, where Christ uh, humbles himself, uh, receiving uh, a, bap a baptism that uh, he didn't need from, uh, uh, from St. John the Baptist. Uh, and upon his um, uh, baptism, uh, the Holy Trinity was revealed in the form of uh, a sound coming from the heaven, uh, the voice of the Father testifying that this was his uh, Son and also the Holy Spirit uh, alighting on uh, uh, on the uh, on the Lord um, in the form of a dove. Um, this, of course, has become the epitome of all theophanies, and perhaps this is uh, something that uh, uh, allowed uh, the early Christians to see similar Christ-centered theophanies in the Old Testament. The way. Uh, the river Jordan, we, we have a revelation of Christ as a true God uh, together with the Father uh, and the Spirit. Uh, in the light of this uh, latest, so to speak, uh, theophany, uh, all the other theophanies of the Old Testament uh, uh, were um, able to be uh, interpreted in a similar way as referring to Christ and uh, his relationship with, uh, with the Father and uh, sometimes the Spirit. Now, uh, uh, slide 9, uh, moving to uh, the last uh, section of, um, uh, of the lecture, the contemplation of God's marks or God's signature in Scripture. Uh, I'll uh, begin by uh, uh, challenging you a bit. On the one hand, we have uh, St. Paul uh, uh, expressing the conviction that uh, whatever is written, that is in scriptures, uh, was written for our guidance and our comfort. That's what he says in Romans chapter 15, verse 4. So, whatever has been written uh, was written for us, uh, for us to receive comfort and guidance. Now, um, when we read particularly um, uh, passages in, uh, in the Old Testament, we stumble on um, uh, texts that are uh, either irrelevant to uh, our experience or um, downright uh, scandalous. Uh, how, how can uh, um, uh, a text like this, you know, uh, one of the patriarchs, Lot, being drunk and um, having intercourse with uh, his two daughters, be, uh, be formative for, for us, uh, contemporary Christians. Um, and I believe that um, this is a legitimate question to ask, and uh, uh, perhaps in order to uh, understand why St. Paul uh, says that everything that was written was written for our comfort and guidance, uh, we have to ask uh, another question. How can we identify the actual divine message that runs alongside the various narratives of human words throughout the scriptures? Uh, and I believe uh, a way of uh, uh, identifying uh, 
the divine word, the, the formative message of scripture, um, is suggested by St. Paul uh, himself again, when in his second uh, letter, the Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 6, uh, he speaks of um, uh, the scriptures in terms of two dimensions. There's the spirit of, uh, of the scriptures and there's the letter of the scriptures. The spirit would correspond to the message, the actual message, and um, the letter would be the text. Uh, I believe that um, uh, this uh, text and other uh, passages uh, uh, like, like this uh, have uh, been taken very seriously from the outset by the early Christians and uh, they have realized the potential of uh, such texts because they would allow for interpretations of those irrelevant looking or scandalous uh, passages particularly in um, in the Old Testament and on, on this I'll be focusing from uh, uh, from now on for the rest of this lecture but before anything I'll uh, uh, just give you an example like uh, for instance in uh, in the fourth century Saint Gregory of Nyssa in his uh, great catechetical oration or the great catechism uh, when he uh, talks about how to read the scriptures he points out the fact that throughout the scriptures there are at least two narratives not just one in his words uh, the immediate text the first or the more most obvious narrative is what he calls historia history stories if you like yeah but alongside uh, that um, uh, first um, uh, and obvious uh, layer runs another, which he calls theoria, uh, which is vision or contemplation. Uh, and uh, according to uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa, uh, everywhere you turn in the scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament, poetical works, wisdom works, um, or uh, legal or historical testimonies and so on and so forth everywhere you turn you are supposed to identify at least these two layers historia and theoria um, the immediate narrative the story and the actual vision or the actual message I believe that uh, in using these words uh, Saint Gregory actually uh, developed uh, what we have already discovered in uh, St. Paul's uh, second letter to the Corinthians, that distinction, so important, uh, hermeneutically speaking, between letter and spirit. Moving to slide 10. I'll give you an example uh, of how you can transform an embarrassing story from the Old Testament into something very um, significant for uh, informative for the uh, Christian experience. Uh, in the book of Genesis, uh, the same patriarch Jacob mentioned earlier, uh, when he reached uh, Mesopotamia uh, and lived in the house of his uh, uncle uh, Laban, uh, got in love with uh, the younger daughter of Laban, Rachel. And in order to win uh, um, uh, in marriage, uh, uh, Rachel, uh, Jacob um, uh, made a contract with Laban. He will be working without any pay for seven years. And at the end of the seven years, uh, he would uh, uh, receive Rachel um, as his wife. Um, all good. Uh, Jacob was a hard-working young man uh, for seven uh, years he worked hard and um, um, the crops and uh, um, uh, the treasures of Laban increased uh, but uh, in uh, the night of, uh, of, uh, of the wedding uh, what uh, Jacob discovered uh, was um, well quite surprisingly that Laban offered him in, uh, in marriage uh, the hand of Leah, uh, the older sister of Rachel, whom he didn't love. <laughs> so what, what, <laughs> what happened? 
um, of course, um, uh, Jacob was uh, was upset, uh, and um, uh, he had uh, almost a fight, an argument with, with Laban. Laban said, "Well, it's the tradition of, of our people: uh, a, uh, a young sister cannot marry before her older sister. Therefore, if you want the hand of." Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> of Rachel in marriage, you have to uh, work hard. And another contract, the next seven years, uh, uh, Jacob worked hard for, um, uh, for Rachel to, to win Rachel as his, his wife. At the end of uh, uh, seven more years, uh, Jacob uh, got married to Rachel. And in 14 years, uh, the patriarch uh, of Israel managed to win two wives. That's the story and uh, it can be disturbing and it is disturbing <laughs> on uh, a number of ways at least when we read it with the eyes of uh, uh, our what a, contemporary habits. Um, but the tension that is inbuilt to this story was perceived as such far earlier than the 21st century. We aren't the first to realize that it was something fishy there in that whole business with uh, Jacob having to work for 14 years in order to get two wives. And for instance, in a text from uh, uh, the 8th century, re-edited in the 9th century, uh, the uh, great canon of repentance of uh, St. Andrew of Crete, uh, we have uh, a sample of interpretation uh, that has avoided uh, the more questionable aspect of, of that affair. Uh, what we read in the Great Canon of Repentance is the fact that the two wives are actually uh, symbols. Leah was very productive and uh, she gave to Jacob like 10 children or something. Uh, Rachel was um, less productive, uh, more withdrawn uh, and she only gave Jacob two children. Uh, St. Andrew of Crete uh, took uh, the, uh, the two uh, characters, the two female characters, as uh, signifying praxis and theoria. Uh, perhaps remember uh, what we have learned from Evagrius Ponticus that uh, in order for one to uh, uh, proceed towards uh, higher contemplations uh, towards uh, a superior spiritual contemplation, theoria, one should under undertake uh, praxis or ascesis or purification. Well, uh, St. Andrew of Crete read that story with <laughs> Jacob and, and the two wives and what he saw there was a different narrative. He did not deny the fact that, well, that's the story, that's the historia, to use the word of St. Gregory uh, of Nyssa. Uh, that's the narrative uh, of the patriarch. But what he was interested in was um, actually the formative dimension of that story. What can be so formative in that story? At face value, nothing. But uh, when you look at the, uh, the parallel narrative, the divine word, as it were, conveyed through that first um, uh, uh, historical narrative, what you find is a very different story. Jacob was someone interested in the way of perfection, says St. Andrew of Crete. And the great canon is um, a huge poem. So you read uh, a scriptural interpretation rendered poetically. Jacob was interested in the way of perfection in order to progress uh, um, in this journey. Uh, he had to uh, work hard for seven years in order to acquire uh, virtue, purification, and then seven more years to become a contemplative mind, someone uh, who was able to recognize uh, the signature of God in all things. And there you go, uh, in, uh, in the 8th century, re-edited in the 9th century, the great canon of repentance, teaches us how to look at um, uh, very strange stories in the Old Testament particularly, including that of uh, uh, Jacob and, and his two wives, and see their aspects that 
are relevant to our own experience today. Because in order to make sense of God, uh, in order to uh, identify the signature of God in, in all things, including in the circumstances of our own lives, to uh, grasp uh, the signs of divine providence in our lives, we need to uh, look beyond the text to that word of God that is uh, uh, uttered uh, alongside our story, so to speak. Another example on uh, slide 11, uh, how to get to uh, the divine word um, or what does that mean to uh, reach the divine word uh, which runs parallel to uh, the narratives within the scriptures. Um, and I have uh, uh, selected two examples. Uh, one uh, comes from Saint Cyril of Alexandria, uh, early 5th century, who in his elegant interpretations, the so-called Galafira, that's the uh, title of the book, uh, from the, the beginning points out the fact that uh, the Old Testament uh, is like a land in which it is hidden a treasure. Uh, one uh, should read the Old Testament knowing that uh, within that land there is that treasure hidden. Uh, for him the treasure hidden in the land was Christ. And what St. Cyril of Alexandria points out in his Gilafira is the fact that uh, one ha has to uh, expect to find Christ at any corner. Like in uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa, remember the, the distinction, uh, there's the immediate na narrative, the, uh, the Historia, uh, and there's the other uh, narrative, the uh, less obvious narrative, the Word of God, Theoria, the vision. Uh, St. Cyril of Alexandria applies uh, a similar tool, uh, although in different words, and and he uses this analogy with the land and the treasure and he says everywhere you turn in that land in other words the text of scripture you are supposed to dig hard and find the hidden the buried treasure and that treasure is Christ in other words uh, at some level you are, we are supposed to read the scriptures including the Old Testament knowing that uh, at uh, some depth can find Christ and we should find Christ and we should draw everything that happened uh, in the past in the uh, history of God's people should, should we should draw that back to uh, the Lord Christ who is uh, the one through whom the Father speaks through the ages throughout the ages not only in the New Testament the other example uh, in relation to getting to the divine word uh, or the formative message of Scripture uh, comes from uh, origin, uh, a writer um, uh, in Alexandria, Egypt, uh, in um, uh, the third century. Origen, in his first uh, homily on Genesis, uh, begins somehow on a note that is familiar, uh, namely, like in St. Cyril of Alexandria, two centuries after him, uh, he believes that uh, everywhere in the scriptures we should look for Christ. And as an example, he looks at the first word of Scripture, the first word of Genesis in uh, Hebrew Bereshith, uh, and uh, in, in uh, regular translations would be in the beginning. Uh, and uh, when we consider that, uh, that word, that first word, that first sacred word, we should identify uh, as its message not something, but someone. And uh, in order to interpret the first word of Genesis, Origen uh, refers to uh, a verse in Colossians uh, chapter 1 uh, and uh, a verse in John chapter 1, the very beginning of the Gospel. And uh, he identifies uh, that beginning, Bereshith, with Christ Jesus. And uh, his interpretation is again Christological. Uh, 
Genesis is not about when the world was created. Genesis is about the principle of creation, Christ, the one through whom all things were made, as we say in the Creed. Now, more interestingly, uh, throughout this first homily on Genesis, Origen uh, reads the days of creation in a very spiritual, formative way. Uh, I uh, would not go into details, but what I try to convey is the fact that in um, uh, Genesis 1, he saw a whole map of the spiritual journey. Uh, for instance, he made the distinction between the first three days of, of creation, the so-called separations, uh, light separated from, uh, uh, from, from darkness, um, uh, the waters above the firmament and the waters uh, below the firmament, and then dry land separated from, from the waters. He saw those um, uh, three separations as signifying conversion. Put behind the old self uh, a sinful life, a life of ignorance in relation to God, and put on a new self, renewed in the image of, uh, of your Creator, uh, put on a virtuous self. Uh, the second group of three days in, in, in Genesis 1, um, the days of embellishment, um, the heavens are populated by stars and the luminaries, uh, and the waters above are populated by, uh, uh, by birds and the waters below by, by fish and other um, aquatic um, uh, beings, and then the dry land populated by, by terrestrial animals and, and human beings. He saw uh, these embellishments as uh, one's uh, progress in the virtuous and contemplative life. Uh, and the seventh day uh, of, of creation, the Sabbath, is for him a celebration, an anticipation of Sunday, the Lord's Day, the union uh, with God. Um, you'll say, well, <laughs> this has uh, uh, very little to do with uh, the actual narrative of, uh, uh, of Genesis 1. And it does. But remember what we have learned from St. Paul and St. Gregory of Nyssa. In St. Paul, there's the letter and there's the spirit. The letter speaks of the days of creation. But what does the Spirit speak of? In other words, uh, when we read Genesis 1 or any other text from the Scriptures, we should always ask the question, what is the Word of God, or where is the Word of God, or what does the Word of God say running parallel to this or that narrative? I believe that uh, uh, these examples uh, already uh, point us to uh, a conclusion that uh, for the Orthodox, uh, reading the scriptures is not uh, an easy business. Uh, and on um, slide, uh, slide 12, uh, I'm pointing out the fact that um, at least traditionally for the Byzantine Church, the church that the most orthodox refer to. Um, the way of uh, reading the scriptures uh, uh, was that of uh, the so-called mystagogy, uh, the mystagogical method. Um, the fact that uh, this has become paramount for, uh, for the orthodox is signified uh, by three uh, major works written uh, in uh, the seventh century by Saint Maximus the Confessor. Uh, it's a triptych, a trilogy, uh, the Book of Difficulties or the so-called Ambigua already mentioned a few times, uh, a similar book uh, uh, addressed to his friend Thalassius, and uh, the book called The Mystagogy. What is interesting about these three works is uh, that they all operate mystagogically, but uh, the paradigms that they discuss differ. Uh, in the Book of Difficulties, in the Ambigua, uh, the texts that are um, uh, the object of interpretation are uh, various passages from the Fathers of the Church, 
uh, in Tusalasius, the same mystagogical method is applied to scriptural texts. And finally, in um, the book uh, uh, called the Mystagogy, this same method is applied to various symbols within uh, the church architecture and the divine liturgy. Uh, what does, uh, does this mean? Uh, it means the fact that St. Maximus the Confessor uh, offered uh, to God's people a gift. Uh, three handbooks of interpretation. They all follow the same methodology. They all approach um, the objects um, uh, in the same fashion. Uh, but in focusing on different objects, these three books show uh, to us uh, that in order to make sense of our Christian experience, at least the way we Orthodox understand it, uh, we are supposed to dig deeper, work harder, and become more perceptive in relation to uh, the meanings or the spirit or the message that um, the various items uh, convey beyond the visible, the immediate, the, uh, the historical narrative, so to speak. How does this uh, method work? Uh, well, simply put, and uh, to use uh, the words of St. Paul in the second letter of the Corinthians, combined with what uh, uh, we read in uh, the first letter of St. John in the New Testament, uh, it's a matter of uh, moving from uh, uh, the letter to the Spirit and back again um, through uh, the testing of the Spirit. Um, we recognize the words of St. Paul, letter and spirit, uh, and uh, the element uh, that is from the Joannan tradition is that of the testing of the Spirit. Uh, perhaps uh, you remember that passage in the first letter of St. John, uh, should be in chapter 2 or 3 of the letter, uh, where he uh, speaks uh, of the fact that there are many spirits uh, whispering uh, to our ears but we shouldn't uh, accept any spirit we should test we should put those spirits those messages to to some test to check their accuracy and for instance he even offered there a criterion how to check the accuracy of those um, uh, spirits or messages do they proclaim Christ as God incarnate or some of that excuse my paraphrase, but it's a Christological criteria. In other words, uh, irrespective of how you look at the scriptures, um, you need to test uh, your outcomes, your findings. Uh, in order to do so, you need a set of criteria. The Christological criterion is uh, central here, um, and uh, I go with, uh, with St. John. Uh, as we have seen already throughout uh, the tradition of the Church Fathers, uh, Christ is the ultimate um, purpose of Scripture, the ultimate uh, uh, content of Scripture. Uh, so when we find something throughout the Scriptures, we should uh, test that finding in relation to Christ. Now, what does that mean to move from the letter of the Spirit and back again? Um, most people would, uh, uh, would be suspicious in relation to uh, uh, what's usually called allegorical or spiritual interpretation. Even in, uh, in, the, in the Orthodox Church, there are many milieus uh, that uh, uh, operate with the assumption that the only way in which the scriptures uh, uh, should be read um, is the literal way. In other words, they reduce uh, the Word of God to the Word of Man, so to speak. They reduce uh, uh, the Theoria level of uh, uh, of Nisa to uh, uh, the level of Historia. In other words, they mutilate, I'm sorry to put it so bluntly, but that's the, uh, the only way I can uh, do so, uh, they mutilate the message of Scripture by looking at, uh, uh, at the text without its spirit. Uh, in other words, by trying to identify what divine revelation is without the consensus of the community of believers. 
perhaps you remember what I said earlier in, in the lecture, the fact that divine revelation uh, means God's effort to translate God's self to a community of people uh, who, uh, and uh, God establishes a covenant and alliance, a testament with that community. Within the parameters of that alliance and within that community, we're supposed to make sense of, um, uh, of the divine revelation and so proceed to knowing God. Uh, when uh, uh, in contemporary uh, uh, society, uh, even many Orthodox claim that the only way in which we can read the scriptures and we should read the scriptures is the literal uh, way, they deny an entire tradition, more like a few millennia of tradition if we count uh, the tradition of the Old Testament, not only the New Testament. Uh, because everywhere uh, where you turn, uh, we find in the scriptures and uh, in the tradition associated to the scriptures, uh, we find the same distinction repeated in oh so many ways. Letter and spirit, historia, theoria, and so on and so forth. Divine word, human word. We cannot reduce the scriptures to their uh, most obvious uh, meaning, sense. Uh, so, how does it work? Uh, the mystagogical method uh, doesn't abandon the letter. That's uh, the assumption that most people that uh, uh, get stuck with literalism uh, fear. They fear that uh, spiritual interpretation means an abandonment of, uh, of the text of scripture. Far from it. In um, the articulation of St. Maximus the Confessor, it's never a matter of uh, uh, soaring aloft, uh, flying away from the text and never returning. As a matter of fact, uh, St. Maximus was uh, uh, a Christ-centered theologian uh, whose message is very Christological, uh, has always uh, applied uh, the Christological schema, so to speak, to whatever items he considered in his uh, writings. Uh, what's the Christological schema? Well, as uh, made obvious in the scriptures, uh, on the one hand we have a descending schema, the Logos coming down uh, from heaven to us, and an ascending schema, the Logos incarnate, Christ, ascending and sitting at the right hand of the Father. Descending and ascending. Uh, the mystagogical me method functions quite similarly, uh, but in a reverse order. First we should ascend, then we should descend. Uh, moving from the letter, the first narrative, the human word of Scripture, to uh, the divine narrative, the spirit or the message of Scripture, uh, is the ascending movement. Uh, we have to discover, and it takes toil and effort, remember the 14 years spent by Jacob, invested by Jacob, in getting his two wives, praxis and theoria, yeah? according to St. Andrew of Crete. Uh, the spiritual message isn't so obvious, far from it. So we need to uh, purify ourselves, put ourselves in, uh, in, in uh, if you like, in the spirit of Scripture in order to reach, grasp the spirit of Scripture. How do we do that? Uh, we have to look around within tradition and see uh, what various narratives meant to various uh, authenticated uh, uh, legitimate interpreters, canonical interpreters throughout um, uh, the centuries. But in looking to what others have said in relation to those texts, uh, we develop uh, the skill ourselves uh, of digging uh, beyond the text uh, and finding the hidden buried treasure. So, the first uh, step of, uh, of the mystagogical method is to move from the letter to the spirit. Uh, but it's never a matter of remaining there, uh, isolated in the clouds. Uh, what do we find there when we move to uh, the spirit? Uh, we have to return and associate that hidden meaning with what's obvious with the text. 
let me give you an example and, and, and I uh, end on this note. Um, every time we read uh, the scriptures, we discover something new. And for instance, we Orthodox, we have an annual uh, cycle of, uh, of readings. Right? Um, in the night of Pascha, we begin uh, reading the Gospels with the first chapter in St. John. And then um, uh, the Apostolic letters are prefaced uh, by the Acts of the Apostles uh, and we read in uh, the night of, uh, of Pascha the first chapter of Acts uh, and the cycle continues for the whole year every year we have the same texts uh, read uh, and interpreted within uh, uh, the congregations um, again and again and again and again Every time that uh, uh, we look at those texts, there's something old, and there's something new, there's something old in that uh, we refer to the same narrative. But there's something new in that we always discover uh, uh, aspects of that uh, spirit, of that message of the scriptures that has escaped us in previous attempts or in previous experiences with the same text. Uh, what is the meaning of, uh, of this um, um, uh, analogy? What's its significance? Uh, every time that uh, we read, um, say, John chapter 1, uh, in the night of Pascha, we read the same text. We never abandon the text. But every time uh, we, we do so, we also try to unveil different aspects of, uh, of the message that are supposed to enrich our experience and in turn they are supposed to uh, enrich the text itself now uh, first uh, the, the last slide 13 what do we uh, learn what have we learned um, uh, in this lecture is the fact that uh, we know God because God has spoken to us this is very important uh, what makes us able to know him is the fact that God first and foremost came to us in a variety of ways speaking to us disclosing himself to us uh, what else do we know is the fact that God's meaning is not always obvious not even in scripture in other words we need to uh, uh, learn the skill of identifying the divine word uh, behind the human word the message the spirit uh, that runs parallel to the text. Um, this meaning, in the case of scripture, uh, or, or in the case of uh, any theophany, uh, coincides with, um, uh, with the meaning that God has conveyed already through the book of creation. And uh, uh, when we realize this, the fact that uh, the divine message uh, traverses all these forms of revelation, then we can uh, reach a more mature understanding of our faith uh, and a more uh, enriched experience uh, that is uh, uh, offered to us uh, when we contemplate any of these means of revelation, whether scripture, theophany uh, or God's creation.